Hello, welcome to the river. Welcome to Big Mighty Speaker Series. Um, this is a, quite a crowd. We haven't had a crowd like this at the Big Muddy Speaker Series in a few years. Um, our record was 200 people who came to see Janet Moreland talk one time, but this is really awesome. And you know, I'm sure you guys are on the same boat as me, but about once a week I'm like, that's it, I'm quitting Facebook. I do not even see the value. I don't understand. And then, yeah, I mean, the only, re you know, we, we did one email, we did a web page, we put it on Facebook, and you guys are obviously obsessed and that twisted in the mind, and I understand, it's cool, but um, thank you for coming out here. And I know you're gonna enjoy hearing Scott talk about this race, because, um, I don't know, he, he's, he's got a future in uh, <laughs> public speaking and storytelling. But for the moment, I sort of have you as a captive audience, so I'm gonna take advantage of that for a second. Um, my name's Steve Schnarr, and I work for Missouri River Relief. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that, um, our, go our goal and our mission and our passion in life is connecting people to the Missouri River and providing new opportunities for people to experience the river and learn about it. So the Big Muddy Speaker Series, of which this is a part, this is one of the ways we do that. Um, it is generally the second Tuesday of every month, uh, right in this space here at Les Bourgeois Bistro. There are also other organizations in the state that put on Big Muddy Speaker Series in St. Charles and Kansas City too. So we have a website where we all try to share information as soon as we get it. Um, our next talk in uh, February is Corey Dunn. And Corey, where are you at? There he is. Um, and Corey is a, a graduate student at the University of Missouri with the Fish and Wildlife Co-op Unit. And he's gonna talk about um, kind of the diversity of fish that utilize the Missouri River and the Missouri River tributaries. So, um, a deeper dive into the river, um, to the stuff you can't see from the surface, which is um, why we love our scientists to come here and share stuff with us. After that, um, Emily Perigo from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, assuming there still is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, <laughs> will be uh, talking about Asian carp. And she's been working on Asian carp issues for a bunch of years. Um, and if you guys saw videos and pictures of the giant pile of fish they pulled out of Creve Coeur Lake last year. Um, Emily was involved in that, and so she's gonna share some of uh, what was behind the science of that, what they learned in doing that, yada yada. It's gonna be awesome, so that's March. Um, second Tuesday of every month, BigMuddySpeakerSeries.org. We have a Facebook page, or you can check out Missouri River Relief's Facebook page. Um, a few other stuff that River Relief has cooking this year it's the beginning of the year, so we finally, you know, have our stuff figured out more or less for what we're doing for the year. Patty's like, not yet. Um, uh, a few things coming up. February 10th, I think, Sunday, February 10th, thank you, Kevin, is the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. So this is our ninth year doing that. It's a traveling film festival. We select three hours of films um, from a much bigger festival that happens in California of stuff that we think is awesome, relevant, and uh, fun, inspiring. And there's usually one that makes you cry, but it's a secret. We don't tell you till it happens which one that's gonna be. Um, that's at the Blue Note in Columbia. Um, what are tickets? 15? $14? <laughs> 10 for students and then 15 for adults. 15 bucks for adults and 10 bucks for students for the Wild and Scenic Film Festival. And we'll have tickets available online soon, but they'll also be selling them at the Alpine Shop in Columbia uh, starting January 17th. And that's actually a super great way to get them. There's no surcharge. Um, just walk into Alpine Shop and buy them and walk away. Um, March 14th, which is a Thursday, um, we are doing an art auction. It's called the Big Muddy Art and that is gonna be at Orr Street Studios in Columbia. This is a fundraiser for River Relief, and we have artists donating um, all kinds of stuff, photography, 
uh, paintings. Some of it's about the Missouri River, some of it's about all kinds of stuff. Um, it's 10 bucks to get in, and there's hors d'oeuvres and um, hopefully wine and beer. We're working on all that. I'm, I'm sure that'll happen. Um, in fact, maybe we'll get Les Bourgeois to donate some. Why? <laughs> you think? Uh, we'll try that. Um, that's all a fundraiser for River Relief. We share the proceeds 50-50 with the artists. Um, and uh, we've done this once before, and the stuff that walks in the door will blow your mind. It's really awesome. So if you've got a blank wall or a shelf that needs something ultra cool from a local artist, um, check out our website, riverrelief.org, for more information. But don't do that today, because there's not much. There will be more information soon. Um, a couple other things. We do a summer camp, and um, that's open for registration for students 8th to 12th grade. It's the Missouri River Academy. I forget the dates, and it's not in front of me. But um, it's the week before the 340. It's the week before the 340. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Whew. It's going to be awesome. Um, but uh, it is like a truly deep dive experience for if, if you know any kids in that age range um, that are interested in the outdoors at all, like you've got to check this out um, and turn them on to it. We've only got 20 slots, um, and you can find that on our website too. We also have um, internships available, um, and, and there's papers back here about these internships. So those are more for college students. Uh, but summer um, environmental education internships uh, with Missouri River Relief. Um, they actually help put on the River Academy. It's quite a cool experience. Um, and the last thing is, oh, well, first of all, this space is donated by Les Bourgeois Bistro. It's a huge pain in their butt to let us do this the second Tuesday of every month, but they've been doing this for probably five or six years. I'm not even sure. Mary and Eden have been working the bar back there, and this is their day off. So, um, so please buy drinks, tip them. Um, they're amazing and awesome, and I'm so delighted they let us keep doing this. We also have David Owens over here running sound, and he's like an octopus today. He's got all kinds of stuff going on, and he's trying to video it, and maybe we'll get it on YouTube. Melanie over here is live streaming it on Facebook, hopefully, so that's cool. Enough people begged on Facebook and we're giving it a shot. Nine um, people on right now. Nine people right now. <laughs> Jericho's on his phone right now, like streaming himself. Um, well, thanks you guys for showing up. So um, one of the things that River Relief does, you know, we organize river cleanups, we do river education events, all kinds of stuff on the Missouri River. Um, we have a race that we host, the Race to the Dome, which is October 5th this year, I think. Um, sign up is not open yet. But anyway, one of the things we do is help out with the Missouri River 340 race. So we have usually four or five boats of volunteers um, that tag along with the whole race. And um, by the end of the race, you'll be so annoyed by us because every time you try to stop on the bank to relieve yourself. Sure enough, here comes a safety boat. Um, just wanting to make sure you're okay. <laughs> um, we do other stuff out there too, um, but um, it's an event that I'm super proud to be a part of. It's, it's astonishing, it's amazing. Many of you in this room know that already. Some of you, this might be your first time this year and you're just trying to learn all you can. Um, and. It, it will blow your mind. Um, and we're just delighted to have Scott share a few minutes with us tonight um, to share some stories about how this thing turned into um, the dumbest idea ever with 16 of the craziest lunatics ever to swing a paddle on the Missouri River and turned into 500 people showing up in the summer um, to safely um, uh, make their way across the state. So thanks for joining us, Scott. And go for it. Uh, Mr. Owens wants me to check to see if you can hear me in the back. Yeah. More or less? Okay, I'll, I'll put my teacher voice on. Uh, my name is Scott Mansker. I am a school teacher, uh, 27 years. Um, I'll the school district. And um, 
So there's nothing you can do that's going to scare me as an audience, that's for sure. Uh, if you need to uh, go to the bathroom or get on your phone or check text messages, or please go to the bar. Uh, I, you know, my students were all ed uh, at-risk kids, so I always found that just a little bit of uh, altered state of mind always helped the lesson go down a little better. So um, make your visits anytime. Uh, so. You know, Steve asked me to come do this. They, they had me do it in St. Charles and uh, maybe six or eight weeks ago, and I'm happy to come do it again, um, although I lost all my notes from St. Charles, so I mean, I'm hoping that, that my memory is jogged uh, as we go through this. Uh, I know, I appreciate you coming to this, and it's really cool that Steve was telling me there's nine years of this that you guys have been doing Big Money Speaker Series, which I think is awesome because Healthy communities need moments like this to come together and see each other's faces and shake hands and tell stories. And I really think that that's a big part of what River Relief does in connecting people to the river is they have moments like this where we can be here. So thank you, Steve, and to everybody that, that puts this stuff together. And I know you had other choices tonight, and I know there's a big, uh, President Trump has a big speech tonight. Um, and so hopefully you DVR'd that. But, um, I went ahead and snapped a picture because I was going to talk to him about my crowd size tonight. And this is pretty awesome. I'm pretty impressed. Um, that if you came here hoping that this was going to be a like a um, how-to of the 340, you're probably going to be disappointed because that's not what this is. The, the St. Charles uh, deal was they wanted the history of the 340. So it's a history lesson. And hopefully you'll, you'll glean some things anyway if you're here as a rookie paddler and wants to try your first 340. Uh, we have been doing this for 13 years. We are just had sign-ups for the 14th annual MR340. This started in 2006, and that all of a sudden seems like a really long time ago, 2006. I mean, I just saw the movie Vice, if you've seen previews for that. And um, yeah, George Bush was president when this started, and all of a sudden that seems ancient history to me, and I was 37, and now I'm 50, so that's, that's part of it too. Uh, in the beginning, there was a raft, and I have to tell a little bit of this backstory, because all of you have your, just like Marvel superheroes, you have your origin story of how you got your connection to the Missouri River. And mine was in 1989, when me and some friends, we were all 20 years old, and we were at a wedding, one of our one of the guy's siblings, older siblings, was getting married, and we're, we're there because we're 20, and there's a bar, right? So we're at the wedding, and uh, we're sitting around talking, and one of the guys, his name was Matt, he said, you know what I'd really like to do is just build a raft and go down the river, go down the Mississippi River. And I was just like, we have to do that. And um, they were not serious about it, but I was very serious about it. So I started, this is before email, right? So I mean... I'm, I'm making phone calls to them, like, hey, are you, you, wanna, you, know, you in on this? Would you do this? I mean, here's the plan. Here's what I got. I've been doing some research. This is, you couldn't just get on Google and go, like, how do you go down the, the river? So this is, for those of you who are old enough to remember this, you would literally call the library, call, ask a librarian. Do you remember that? And so a librarian hooked me up with, like, Corps of Engineers, and, you know, I got the maps, and... You know, I, I found the styrofoam logs and the scrap lumber, and sure enough, we built a raft, 11 foot by 16, so about the size of like your kid's bedroom, and um, and we had a plan we put in in Kansas City, um, and we were going to just go as, until we couldn't go any further, and someone would pick us up, and uh, it was too big to trailer it. We had to saw it in half to get it to Labanee Park, and we bolted it back together at Labanee. And none of us had been on the Missouri River before. And it's one thing to drive over it, and it's another thing to stand face to face on the ramp. And you see those swirls, and you know, it just looks really forbidding. And, but you know, we had people watching us, our families were there, so we were like, acted like we had this under control. And we slid it off the ramp and into the water, and we, we took off. And it was, at least for me, uh, it was fantastic. I mean, it was everything I had hoped it would be and more. I mean, we're living on this giant uh, square, 
and you know, four guys, a guy on each corner with a paddle, but we didn't do much paddling. I mean, mostly we jumped off of it and swam alongside it and climbed back on and we could cook on it. We had each brought, you know, uh, eight or 10 canned goods that we stole out of mom's kitchen and we had one pot and nobody brought a can opener. So we had to figure that out with like a pocket knife. And um, every, we never, we hit every sandbar we could, I mean, if we saw a sandbar, we'd paddle like crazy to get over there. And um, any town that was coming down the river, I mean, we had the, the core book, so we'd be looking like, oh, man, Waverly is only 10 more miles, you know? <laughs> and to land the thing, I mean, this was not a, a sleek craft by any stretch. So the most athletic guy of us, which was not me, although I will claim second, but the most athletic guy of us would, um, <laughs> you know, you're sailing along the riprap with this, giant heavy raft loaded with gear and guys and this guy Brian all-star soccer player would run and leap off the raft land on the rip wrap scramble up to the tree line he's got a rope in his teeth and he'd wrap it around a branch and then slowly the raft would you know grab on and we'd bounce against the rip wrap and then we quickly realized that even if like a town like Waverly is right there on the water you've got to walk two miles before you're anywhere, before you can eat the biscuits and gravy or the chicken fried steak or all the things we learned that these small towns are really, really good at making. Um, so it was just incredible. And we, uh, we ended up having to paddle at night, which was really awesome too. Um, you know, you're just drifting along and you know, we would only panic when there was a bridge coming because we had to line up for that bridge like 45 minutes before we got to it or we were going to hit it. So, uh, but I was just totally infected by this. I mean, loved it. I couldn't believe we were the only ones out there. You know, we never saw anybody paddling. We saw a couple fishermen. We saw a couple barges, but it was just this wilderness that had always been right outside my door. And so, you know, that was 1989, 1990. I'm buying an old pontoon boat and we're going to the arch. 1991, we're going to Hannibal trying to get to Chief's training camp, which used to be in Wisconsin. Didn't quite make it, but I mean, you know, all these adventures year after year buying junk boats or whatever would float and just finding a way to get back on the river. And always wondering why we were the only ones out there. Always wondering why we didn't see anyone else. Well, finally, uh, the internet comes along and I start to learn about these canoe races like the Texas Water Safari, uh, down in Texas, 260 mile race where you're carrying your boat, you know, 10% of that over log jams and, you know, over dams and things like that. It's a very grueling, terrible race. Anyone done the Texas Water Safari in this room? There's one crazy man right there, <laughs> Hogan Hank, still alive. Would you ever do it again? No. No? Okay. <laughs> so, and I read the Texas Water Safari rules. I was like, man, I want to do this. This sounds so awesome. And I read the rules. I'm like, they got some really crazy rules. I mean, you know, you rules about what kind of food you can be given and how the, and they've changed some of those in the last few years, but just really restrictive rules for a lot of reasons. It's the culture of that race. It's been going on for 50 plus years now, I think. And then another one was the Yukon River Quest, which is a 420 mile race, I think, or 460 maybe, 460. Uh, but it has mandatory layovers where you have to do, I think a total of 10 hours like a seven hour layover and a three hour layover or something like that where they require you to be off the water. Um, and then there were all these USCA, United States Canoe Association races, which are just crazy. Like they measure every boat and they have multiple, you know, they can't even put enough people to fill all the divisions. I mean, if you go there and you're in the age 60 to 62 bracket and your boat is 17 to 17, three inches long and you know, it's all these uh, really hybrid uh, levels of, you know, disaggregation of the, the field. And so you can go there and win a medal for sure, but you're only competing against, you know, the one other guy that showed up in your class. So it was all very strange and weird to me. And I started kind of drafting my own rules, like, well, what would this look like on the Missouri River? You know, how would we do it? What would the rules be? And the rules were really pretty simple as I started to do it. And so this was probably 1996 or seven. Um, I know that because of where I, what building I worked in at the time. And just every year, legal pad, get it out probably in October and start drafting the race. Like, what's this going to look like? How would we do it? What would, what would be the rules? And so on. Um, but I never did anything with it because we kind of talk ourselves out of 
um, good ideas sometimes and because we're scared of what could go wrong, right? I thought of all the ways it could go wrong, all the ways it could be you know, a tragedy. And so um, I never did pull the trigger on it. But uh, one of the things that helped pull the trigger was I met this guy, Russ Pizant, and he and I met on a little kayaking trip on the Kansas River. And I started telling him about you know, the trips I've done on the Missouri and this idea for this race. And he kind of nodded his head, which is what most people did when I would <laughs> tell that long story. And, and say, so, yeah, that sounds really interesting. And he and I started doing trips and kind of building some boats together and taking some long trips. And finally, one year, I just said, you know what? We're going to do it. We're gonna, I'm going to put up a website, and we're going to see who shows up. I don't think anybody will show up, but if we can get one or two people to come to this race, then I'll, I'll paddle with them, and it'll be a proof of concept, right? We're going to just see if guys can get in the water at Kansas City and can make it across the state to St. Charles. What does that look like? How does that work? Um, so I put up the website, and it's very rudimentary. You know, you had to print off the entry form and mail it in. I don't know if anybody, I think I put some flyers up in some towns, maybe even Rhodesport or Columbia, I don't know, just on bulletin boards. I mean, it was really primitive. This would have been 2006. And entry forms started coming in my mailbox. <laughs> and um, some of them from, you know, you got the, the ones from Missouri, but then I got one from North Carolina, and I got one from Texas, and I got another one from Texas. And phone calls started coming in, asking me questions about the rules, like, hey, what, you know, you say you have to have letter or numbers on the boat, what size numbers do you want? I'm just like, um, three inches? I mean, you know, just like, you know, trying to sound like I knew what I was doing, but I had no idea what I was doing. And we eventually ended up with 11 boats, 15 people. It had outgrown my ability to paddle it. Like, I couldn't paddle it now. Like, I had a Coast Guard, uh, permit and a Missouri Water Patrol permit and I had to be the safety contact and you know it was it was the real deal now so now I was the race director not the paddler who would get to just go out there and and have fun the naivete of Russ and I as we were putting this first race together was that we have two safety boats Russ had that cabin cruiser he was in he was going to be up front and he would lead the the boats down the river and he would check on maybe the first five boats, you know, once a day. He'd check on each boat. How you doing? How's it going? Do you need anything? What can we do for you? And I would be at the back in this boat, what we call the Call Warrior, which is a little uh, Grumman square stern uh, rated for three horsepower. So we put 15 horsepower. <laughs> and I would do the same thing from the back. I would follow the back boat, but I would sneak up and check those, you know, the back six boats, checking in on them every day. Maybe I'd even run into you, Russ. Maybe we'll see each other, you know, once a day and trade stories on how it was going. No way, no, no way, shape, or form is that what happened. Uh, another shot of the Call Warrior. Um, it's a great boat, yes, but I would never do the 340 interview. Okay, so... That was the roster that year, and we were absolutely <laughs> clueless about what we were all about. Now, I felt like I had an encyclopedic knowledge of the river from Kansas City to St. Charles, and really, I did. I had done it countless times. Like, I could not remember how many times I had made that trip from Kansas City to St. Charles and back. And so I knew where all the restaurants were. All, you know, I knew you could get water in the park at Waverly. I knew you could get water in the park at, at Glasgow. I mean, we had, we had planned this all out and told people, like, here's how you do it. Here's where you get your resources. Uh, but there was so much we, we did not know and were not prepared for. One of the guys that signed up for that first race, thankfully, was West Hansen. And West Hansen um, was a very well-decorated Texas canoe racer. And in Texas, they do it very, very differently and they've been doing it for many, many years. <clears throat> and so when I saw West had signed up for the race, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I mean, we have a real racer coming to do this race now. And he brought this boat, and we had, none of us had seen anything like this before. I mean, it's a solo boat, 22 feet long solo boat. I mean, there are boats that carry three people in the 340 that are 17 feet long. But this is one guy in a 22 foot carbon boat that you could pick up with one hand. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's specially designed for racing the Texas Water Safari. Very lightweight, but very tough and durable boat, and very fast. 
you know, you can really get that boat moving. So he came to the race, and we were all just in awe, like the, the crowd parted and Wes <laughs> carried his boat down to the water and laid it gently in, and we were all just kind of watching. And, but he was so nice and so approachable and um, just a wonderful, wonderful guy and was very gracious in how he kind of showed people what was up. But you can see, like, the average boat that first year <laughs> is the guy with the dry bag strapped to the front of his boat. I don't know if he's here tonight. I don't think he is. Um, he made it like three miles. Literally, I'm not even kidding. Like, he made it to that first boat ramp on the other side of Kansas City, and he, and he pulled out. So that, that was the field, kind of. West Hansen in his uh, carbon fiber boat and everybody else. But there were some interesting folks in that first year. Uh, that's the safety meeting at the boat ramp. That's me, uh, a long time ago. And uh, that's the, the group. You've got ground crew people there. You've got racers there. And you've got people who just showed up because they wanted to see, like, you know, like NASCAR. They wanted to see the crash. So uh, we're at Caw Point, and I'm telling them, you know, go out on the river, turn right, and go under the, you know. But I had prepped them all with emails and so on before. I mean, we, we do an email training. So this was kind of a review and everybody kind of getting faces with names. Um, here's another view of that first meeting. Now, for those of you who've been to a 340 recently, you will find this very interesting. Because, I mean, it's chaos now at the beginning of the 340. We have, we have had to turn it into two starts because there's just so many boats in the water at a time. Here's what a safety meeting looks like now. You can't even, I mean, that's, that's half the room. The other half is to my left. Um, 1,200 seats is what we buy from the uh, convention center, and they're always completely full with people standing and sitting on the floor. Um, so it's turned into to quite a monster. But this was the, uh, the first start. Uh, there's a few more boats in the background that you can't see, but there's West uh, right there. And that was about the last we saw him. <laughs> um, it was it was fun while it lasted. I had uh, a couple goals for that first year. And I told this only to Russ. I said, Russ, we need somebody to finish. I honestly didn't know if somebody could finish. I mean, West had done the Texas Water Safari a dozen times, but that's 260 miles, and this is 340 miles. And we were giving them 100 hours to complete the race. But like, we need somebody to finish this race and nobody to die. Those were the two. You know, I'd set those goals. If we can somehow ride between those lines, um, that's all we really wanted for that first year, to prove that it was workable. <clears throat> so, of course, the first night, uh, we had a horrific storm. I mean, we've never had a storm like this on any 340 cents, thank goodness. Um, I had never seen anything like it on the river. Of course it came at night. Uh, we were, I was bringing the back of the pack up to Waverly, and I was just trying to get those last two boats into Waverly before the storm hit. We could see lightning flashing in the distance. Super hot, muggy, Missouri, yeah. just still, like there wasn't any wind or anything. It was just like this oppressive, humid night. But you could see this storm on the horizon. And I did manage to get those last couple boats in, um, and... And then I pulled my boat up onto the ramp, and then just all hell broke loose. Before, before you felt any wind at all, you heard tree branches breaking. Like you could hear trees breaking. You're like, what? what is going on? And then all of a sudden, just this hurricane hit. And I remember vividly standing in the parking lot, the lower parking lot there at the Waverly boat ramp, and I could feel gravel hitting me in the face from the wind. And um, the river just turned into this chaos. Now, it's, it's pitch dark, but if you shined your light out on the river, you just saw white caps uh, coming from every which way. My boat, the Caw Warrior, which I had pulled up onto the ramp, like pulled it up enough that I knew it wasn't going anywhere. The waves hitting that ramp were so big that it filled the boat at the back. Like they were crashing over the motor and filled the boat. So we're all, the, those of us that were there, and there were probably, most of the boats were there. There were. I had the back, and there was a couple boats at Miami I learned later, 
and, um, and then West Hanson way out front. <laughs> and some people sprinkled in between. Um, so I had maybe three boats worth of people and we were hunkered under the little picnic shelter there in Robin Kaltoff's uh, Waverly Park. And uh, just, we couldn't even hear each other. I mean, we're just, you know, trying to survive that first 15 minute burst of the storm. And then it sort of subsided and it's just raining and a little bit windy. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was incredible. And I was 100% sure that we had killed people. I mean, I was just sure, like, the deepest sinking feeling I'd ever had, like there's no way anybody who was on the water when that hit survived. So I was hoping and hoping that people had gotten off the water in time. Um, the system we had for tracking people back then was that you were supposed to text your mile marker in every eight hours, I think it was. Could have been 12, but I feel like it was eight hours. Just if you, you know, that was an eight hour window. As soon as you texted in, your eight hour clock started again. So, um, we kind of had a ballpark where people would have been or should have been. Um, it's probably 10 o'clock at night, and my phone rings. 2006, flip out my flip phone, open it up, and it's an area code I don't recognize. And I answer the phone, and it's a call from North Carolina. And we had one racer from North Carolina. Her name was Don Keller, and she was a badass. I mean, she was an impressive human being. She paddled, did guided tours off the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and she helped train Navy SEALs at the base nearby there, I don't know where, on, uh, on their kayaking and paddling skills. So, Don Keller. And uh, this was her friend uh, from North Carolina who called me because Don had called her to say that Don was in danger and needed to be picked up. Uh, she didn't call our safety number because that had blown away. And um, so she's like, she doesn't know where she is. Um, she's really shook up. She thinks she's hurt. Her boat's destroyed. She needs to be picked up. And so I'm looking at my canoe full of water. The waves are still out there just smashing on, you know, onto the canoe. And like, uh, okay, well, <laughs> uh, I'm going to give her a call and, you know, we'll go get her. So I called Dawn and she was pretty shaken. And she said, uh, I'm not sure where I am. I left Waverly this much time ago. I'm on this big arcing bend. And so Robin knows where she was, I'm sure. And some of you know where she was talking about. So uh, I said, okay, I'm going to come get you. So, you know, it was one of those moments where I knew what I, I knew it was my job to go get her. I was terrified to take my boat out there. I mean, I was just 100% sure the boat was going to sink 15 feet off the ramp just from the waves. Uh, but I knew that's what I had to do. So I was like, let's just get this over with. I mean, I'm going to go try to get her, and uh, I'm going to sink my boat, and hopefully I won't drown. <laughs> so I pumped the boat out, and there were some wonderful ground crews there. And I offloaded all that gear from the boat because I knew I needed to be as light as possible. And I took off into the night, and I'm skipping over these waves, and I, and I kind of think I know where she is. And sure enough, I see this strobe light flashing just exactly where she described on that big bend, um, you know, before you get to Hills Island. And I got there and I couldn't believe what I saw. I mean, her boat, which is, was this really high-end carbon fiber touring kayak, was six feet up the riprap and it looked like an explosion had just taken place. I mean, there's just clothing and gear and stuff just everywhere. And I see the strobe light is up at the tree line, like way up there. And she's just fetal position, huddled under this tree. Um, waiting for someone to come get her. And I said, hey, Don, I'm trying to, you know, talk really lighthearted. <laughs> you know, hey, Don, boy, that was a crazy storm, wasn't it? Yeah, that was, holy cow. And tied my boat up, and, you know, it's just banging into the riprap from the waves. And uh, I climb up there, and I, you know, I'm surveying the scene. I said, did you drag your boat up here? She's like, no, that's where I got out of my boat. Like, that is where the water deposited me and the wind deposited me. She said, I have been paddling in the ocean all my life. I have never seen anything like that before in my life. You know, welcome to Missouri, right? I mean, that's, I said, well, that's kind of how our storms go out here. They're just uh, Hiroshima, and then, you know, it calms down. Uh, but, you know, we, we kind of put their stuff up and put it back together. She's like, I'm sure my boat's destroyed. And, and you know, kind of felt the bottom of it. It's like, you know, we're doing all this in the the dead of night. I, like, I don't feel any cracks. You know, we got it in the water. We tied it alongside my boat. 
and uh, got her across the river to Hills Island and, you know, kind of put, put our lives back together again. And uh, she, she spent the night there in a tent. I put up a tent for her. I stayed with her. And, you know, in the morning I thought for sure, like, she's just going to need a ride to Miami and then we're going to have to figure out how to get her to North Carolina. Um, but in the morning she got up and it was a sunny, beautiful day. And she kind of just looks around and flexes her giant Don Keller muscles, and she, she gets back in her kayak. She's like, "Well, I'll see you." I was like, "Okay," you know. And she's gone. And she she ends up winning, you know, the women's solo division. So I mean, and so at this point, still, I hadn't heard from anybody else. You know, I don't know if anybody else is hurt, damaged, alive, whatever. But then slowly, as the sun came up, my phone, you know, I get the messages like, "I'm okay. I'm here. I'm okay. I'm here." And I've Talked to Russ, he's like, you know, I was, he was with West Hanson, and he said, you know, his, Russ's boat, the cabin cruiser, got blown up onto a mud flat, and West helped him wrestle it off the mud flat, and then they took off again. So they were like past Glasgow by now. Like it was ancient history to them. But everybody survived, everybody lived, and we moved on. And I suddenly felt like, wow, you know, we, we don't know what we're doing, but we dodged a huge bullet here. So maybe, the gods are on our side. The other thing that happened that second day was this picture was on the front page of USA Today. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some Kansas City reporter had taken the picture. This is at the starting line. And USA Today had picked it up. And they ran it on their front page the day after the race. And, it's, and it had a little story, a little tiny, you know, eight-line story. Racers in Missouri plan to paddle day and night across the state of Missouri in the first annual Missouri River 340. And my phone was going crazy from that picture. I had radio stations calling me, you know, KMOX and all these Missouri radio stations calling, tell us about this race. Um, and, you know, just all this positive press was coming in from this picture. I was like, oh my gosh, we're really onto something here. And then the other people who saw this picture was the Coast Guard. <laughs> and they were like, what the hell are you guys doing? And I was like, I filled out a permit with you guys, you know, six months ago. And you're like, OK, well, so you're, you're uh, taking all these people down the river? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what the permit said. You know, it really became obvious to me that like, they weren't paying a whole lot of attention to this permit. And that story would be to be continued into another year. The, uh, the other thing that happened that year that almost, I think, just killed the race the first, first go round was, uh, we quickly realized that two safety boats was not anywhere near enough. I only saw those three paddlers at the back. Russ only saw West Hanson. And all those boats in between never saw a safety boat. And, you know, we didn't promise them they'd see a safety boat, but had they needed a safety boat, it was very clear that we were inadequately covering the, the safety for this race because West Hanson finished this race in about 50 hours, uh, and then the other people finished in 100 hours. So there's two days between you know, West Hanson and some of the field. And that became painfully apparent when I got another call, and this time I was at Glasgow, or near Glasgow, I was out in the middle of the river, and I get a call from James Fawcett, who was this just incredible triathlete, in shape guy, and he was racing, and he was pretty far up in the pack. And uh, one of the strategies, again, we were all new at this, one of the strategies that some people employed that year were they were filtering river water to drink rather than, than carrying water or seeking out water along the race course. And it caught up with James, um, and he called me and said, you know, through grunts of pain, like, I, I got to get picked up. I came and stand up. Uh, I'm having really bad cramps, and I don't know if I'm, how long I'm going to even be able to stay awake on this phone call. And so, I mean, he doesn't know where he is, and I don't know where he is, and he thinks he's about to be unconscious. So I said, well, what's the last town you remember? He said, well, I remember passing the Capitol. Like, okay, well, about how long ago was that? He's like, I don't know. I've been kind of in and out of it. And I said, well, what do you see when you look around? He said, well, I'm on the bank, and there's like some train tracks behind me, and there's a sandbar across the river. <laughs> and I'm again, like, this is my... <laughs> Somebody was watching over us because I know exactly the place he's describing. I said, if you look upstream to your left, 
do you see like a tributary coming in? He's like, yeah, I think so. I was like, let me make a phone call. I'll call you right back. So this guy here on this picture, this guy reclining here at leisure is a man named Soda Pop. And how many of you know Soda Pop? Okay. So you can vouch for me that that's his real name. Okay? Well, supposedly. It's on his driver's license. But I, met, I had met Soda Pop back in the early 90s on one of my crazy pontoon trips. He sold me gasoline. He ran a little gas dock on the Osage River. And I had his number in my flip phone. And I called Soda Pop. And I said, Soda, I, I, he knew about the race. And I said, I, I think one of our racers is just, you know, he's 10 minutes away from you. Uh, I think he's just right outside the confluence, river right by the train tracks. He needs picked up right away. And Soda's got this, you know, deep baritone voice. I'm Soda Pop, how are you? And he's like, I'll, go, I'll head right out there. And uh, so I hang up with Soda Pop and I call James. I said, James, I got a guy that's going to be there in five minutes. He's like, what? Really? I was a hundred, hundred miles away. Russ is at the finish line in St. Charles and has been for a day with West. So there's a hundred miles between both safety boats and James is right in the middle. And I said, I just want to stay on the phone with you until the guy gets there. Like, oh, what's his name? Soda Pop. Okay, well, you know. I mean, James thinks this is all a hallucination. And I said, pretty soon you're going to see a long, skinny John boat come out of that river. He's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I think I see it. And uh, I said, well, his, his, you know, he's going to be there in just a second. He's going to take care of you. And then, you know, I can hear the motor over the phone, like, eh. And, uh, and then, you know, pretty soon I hear this deep bass voice saying, are you James Fawcett? <laughs> Like, yes, I am. I said, all right, guys, it sounds like you got it figured out. So Soda took him back to his house, got him on the couch, called his wife. His wife drove from St. Charles, picked him up, and James Fawcett lived to, to puke another day. <laughs> uh, this is what our finish line used to look like for those weary people that would come across. Russ, Russ literally carried the trophies in the boat, in the safety boat, from Kansas City to the finish. I mean, that's how bare bones we were. So he had the trophy in the safety boat. You made it to the uh, pallet, and he shook your hand, and he handed you a trophy, and we didn't know what to do after that. So that was 2006. Now, I'm not going to go through every year, obviously, just hitting some highlights here. But 2007, we'd been in USA Today. I'd been doing river or radio interviews during the first 340. I mean, we were ready for an onslaught, so we had to think, how many people are we going to allow to do this race? Because the phone call I was getting most commonly was, when does sign up start? And how many people are you going to let be in this race? And like, I started thinking, I don't know how many people we can have in this race. I mean, if we had that many problems with 11 boats, you know, how many, how many boats do we really want to do? We invested and bought a third safety boat and manned that one. She said, okay, we got another boat. Let's uh, really roll the dice here. I, I'm not sure how many boats you can even fit in call point there, you know? And I thought, could you fit 75 boats? Maybe you could fit 75, but I couldn't even picture 75 canoes in one spot. So we limited that next year to 75 boats. And obviously it sold out very quickly and we had our contingent ready for round two and a lot of the veterans came back. And I believe Doug Jennings, was that your first year? Yeah, so Doug Jennings, who has done the race 12 of the 13 years, was there for that first year of, that we had 75 boats. And sure enough, they did fit all there in uh, Oh, that's right, you still got the shirt on. Yeah, that's an original 2007 shirt there. Wow, that is vintage. You made it where? So what's the, you made it to the pallet. So, so what's the big story from 07 that you remember? Anything? Well, there was a whole lot of information, and most of it was not usable. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, there was, uh, so we... No drones, no cell phones, no, we did it with Matthew. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this was before we had all the technology um, that we had today, and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, that, we, we definitely had the same goals, and I think that was, I think it was the first year Jeff Barrow did the race, um, also, and he's not here tonight, but... Uh, yeah, and, and uh, that was also the year, if you remember, that we had an incident with a barge. Um, in fact, it was this barge. Uh, this is the asphalt barge that runs to Kansas City once a week. 
And uh, here it is going through Dana Key's neighborhood. Um, and we had, we had a couple from California that uh, came out to do the race. Um, $5,000 hooky outrigger. And, um, and they, you know, we, we'd explained how you would negotiate a barge crossing in a channel and so on. And they kind of did that thing that the squirrel does when it's trying to run across your car. Um, go left, go right, go left, go right. Uh, anyway, they, they miscalculated on where the barge was going to be in the crossing. And they ended up going under the front of the barge. In the middle of the night, um, upstream or downstream of Herman, near Herman. I think it was downstream of Herman. Anyway, thankfully, the guy driving this boat, and I can't remember his name right now, but he ended up being a safety boat for us a couple years later. Awesome guy. But he saw it all happening. I mean, he could see the slow motion disaster that was about to unfold. So he was able to put the boat uh, in neutral and then even in reverse, which is not anything he would want to be doing while he was going upstream. And he was able to sort of give them time to swim out the side of the, the barge load and his crew were quick on the job and pulled the couple out. They had some scrapes, they coughed up some water, uh, their boat was utterly destroyed by the propellers of the barge, but they were okay. And, um, and so that was a near disaster. And I, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I got the call from the Missouri Water Patrol, they wanted to do a report, um, reporters started calling, uh, and then, sure enough, I got that follow-up call from the Coast Guard. Um, and I remember it so well. I was standing at Franklin Island on that godforsaken Franklin Island boat ramp. <laughs> Nobody there. You know, the last paddlers are gone. It's sunrise. And it's one of the few places I could get a signal because Boonville's right there. And my phone rings at the Coast Guard. And they are so pissed. And they're like, what are you guys doing out there? They're like, we just had this conversation a year ago. And I filled out. He's like, we were not under the impression that you were having paddlers out there at night. I said, well, this is, yeah, this is the second year we've done it, and it's very clearly written in the, in the permit, and yes, we have. And they, so they were furious with me, and I was just, I had had it, I was done, I was never going to do this thing again. And later that day, I met Jeff Barrow. And Jeff was doing the race, he was on his book tour, Mr. Hollywood, uh, he, he, was, he was pretty far up in the pack, but he had to do a book signing in Jefferson City or somewhere like that. So he had gotten off the water for a while and then leisurely made it back to his boat. So he was at the back of the pack with me for one of the last nights of the race. He's like, how's it going? I was like, it's going terrible. Like, I'm getting yelled at by the Coast Guard, yelled at by the Water Patrol. Uh, newspaper reporters are, you know, asking what's the next, what's the next tragedy that's happened. Did anybody get hurt today? You know, that's the kind of calls I was getting. I said, I'm not doing this again. I mean, River Relief, if you want to put this race on, you put this race on, but I'm done. And he said, now hang on, you know, he gave me the, you know, he was Gandalf, right? And I was, <laughs> he's like, I'm part of this organization called Missouri River Relief. And perhaps there's some way that we could assist you uh, and putting this event on. Let me make sure I'm running out of time here. So, uh, I, so he said, let's talk after the race and let's figure out a way to, uh, to make this happen. And, you know, that's when I reacquainted myself with Steve Schnarr, Jesus of the River. <laughs> I had met Steve years and years before the race at a random meeting at Cooper's Landing, but now, uh, you know, we, we sort of started talking as we started planning for 08, and, uh, you know, Steve and Jeff and Melanie and all the folks at River Relief have really allowed this race to go from, you know, limping down the river with 75 canoes to 500 plus boats and all that it has become today. They and their team, please, if you're a volunteer or work with River Relief, please raise your hand so we can just, yeah. I mean, huge group of amazing people that know the river and understand everything we're doing out there. So the next year, they gave us three teams in three safety boats, and I was finally able to like put these pieces of the puzzle in place. Now I had three boats that I could call in the middle of the night and say, go get this guy. I could send them out in a storm and say, this girl needs your help right now. Can you go get them? These were the boats I could rely on and call. 
anytime I needed them. And it made a huge difference. Here's another River Relief team in action out there during the race. Uh, here's the growth over the years. Um, you can see these, these orange bars are where we had flood delays. And so a big part of the field couldn't make the makeup dates. But for the most part, we've tried to carefully grow the race. We did 75 that year. The next year, I allowed 150. That's how many started. The next year, we allowed 300. That's how many showed up and started. And so we slowly worked our way up. This past year, we allowed 500 boats, and 433 actually started the race. So steady, controlled growth. We did not want to grow too fast, because every year, we had to add safety boats and add infrastructure to make it uh, a race that could function safely. And of course, that leads us to sponsors who have helped us along the way with volunteers and resources and money and things to raffle off and you know so we can make donations to River Relief and make donations to all our partners that help Missouri American Water being the title sponsor so we upgraded from pallets to a lot more pallets with plywood on top and then finally last year we upgraded to an actual dock in the water that Missouri American Water built for us this year they're going to add a second dock because we just need a second dock this is kind of the show they put on, or help put on at uh, Jefferson City. Uh, they staff that checkpoint night and day there, and they help groom the sand and all the things that need to be done at that awesome checkpoint. Joe Wilson is a guy who has sadly passed away, but many of you know Joe. And he was an early, early friend of the race, and he saw it from you know the year we had 75 all the way until just a couple years ago, and he was an awesome resource for us at Jeff City. That role's kind of been taken over by Senka Honecker. She does that now at Jeff City. The, the point of this is that guys like Robin Kaltoff and uh, so many others, thank you, Robin, uh, take on the responsibility of manning a checkpoint. Robin does the Waverly checkpoint, which is <laughs> the second checkpoint of the race in his crazy town for about four hours. This year we got an extra <laughs> See, so it just keeps getting better. So, yeah, so I mean, th that's what this race needs for it to function properly are incredible volunteers who step up to the plate and do those kind of things. Um, this, you know, this isn't going to make any sense to you, but uh, this is just river levels from the different years all the way till last year. So, this was last year, this blue line. Uh, all the way across. This was the highest water year we had in 2015. A lot of records fell that year. Um, high water helps. This is a cool map that Steve puts together for us every year. It shows all the checkpoints and all the uh, places you can get resources and help from the race and when they open and when they close. Uh, we try to give the racers as much information as we can. Uh, this is kind of a look of what like the solo start looks like. We do two starts of the race now. It's just too many boats. The Kansas City Fire Department, Milan Rogers, member of that fine squad is here somewhere. Uh, they put their Swiftwater rescue boats out because we go through like five bridges, boom, 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 right out of Kansas City. And a lot of these paddlers, this is their first time on the Missouri River. Welcome to the Missouri River. Go paddle with, you know, 500 boats through these bridges. So the fire department helps us out and we split it up for them, um, just to give you a feel of what it looks like out there while you're listening to the national anthem. Uh, one river, 400 boats, 340 miles. You do the math, I'm too tired. That is <laughs> for sure. Another look at what the start looks like. Again, that just looks like a solo start. Um, they're going through Kansas City. This is part of that safety boat fleet that we've been slowly amassing over the years. And every year we try to invest ten dollars to $15,000 in at least getting another safety boat out or putting new motors on a safety boat or something like that. These are all old aluminum vintage boats that you can find on Craigslist for like a thousand bucks. And then we invest money to make them just as mechanically bulletproof as we can. Try to put twin motors on them, four strokes, huge fuel capacity, chart plotters, just everything that helps them do their job. That's us triple parked at Cooper's Landing. <laughs> uh, this is the Reaper. This is a boat that we made special, yes. Um, Reaper's not here, relax, you can say it. Uh, the Reaper is the pace boat, and so the guys that drive the Reaper, or girls some years, depends on who wants to do it. 
Um, their job is to go exactly the pace of the cutoff times. So if you're a paddler and this boat is in front of you, that means you're going too slow. And if it beats you to the checkpoint, you're out of the race. So you don't want to get reaped. So that's become um, kind of a fun part of the race. People talk about the reaper. It rarely catches anybody, but it's always sad when it does. And you, you know, the interesting thing we learned as we got to six, seven, eight, nine safety boats, you know, that we were responsible for, it's hard to have eight or nine trucks to get them back from the finish line. So uh, what we do is we boat back, and um, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, the Saturday after the race ends, those boats turn upstream and head back to Kansas City. One cool thing that has happened is the technology and. Um, Race Owl and the uh, Pro Paddler apps, which are really pretty awesome. I'm sure many of you have that on your phone right now. It's uh, an app built by John Marble and Hogan Hake, and they're both right here in the middle. They are not here to do tech support tonight. I told them I wouldn't uh, have them doing your tech support, so you'll have to catch them later. But um, these guys built these apps that really help streamline the process of you checking in. And the Pro Paddler app um, is awesome because it has a map. I mean, it, he has built for, I think it's five bucks that he charges you for this, what we have paid routinely eight or nine hundred dollars to install in our safety boats. It's a chart plotter. And it has the map of the Missouri River right there. And it shows you as this little icon, shows you every wing dam, every island, every bridge piling, everything you need to worry about. Best five dollars you would ever spend. Uh, another shot of a safety meeting, a um, lot of people, just the energy in that room is, is so intense and you can just smell the, the fear and testosterone. <laughs> We've had a lot of uh, crazy people do this race and a lot of crazy configurations. Um, one thing we've learned is we get a lot of people who come back and do it again and again, like Doug Jennings, who's done it 12 times and is signed up to do it a 13th time. Uh, coming up in July, there's only one person remaining from that first group in 06 who's done it every single time, and that's this young lady, Di McHenry. Some of you may know her, um, but she has done the race, women's solo, mixed tandem, women's tandem. I mean, just almost every division you can do, and she is, again, signed up this year, the only person to be out there all 14 times. Um, we've also had lots of... Uh, crazy ideas come to pass, uh, like this six man, six? I think someone's asleep, but uh, yeah, they had a bunch of people on that. Uh, and it, it's just, you know, such a unique community is built out there during that week. Um, you just see so many cool moments among family and friends as they make this struggle happen down the river. Uh, lots of different creative ways to sleep. One thing we've learned is um, you reach a point where it doesn't matter. You can sleep anywhere. I mean, it could be on the rocks, it can be in the mud, it can be on the back of a boat. You're asleep in seconds. Sleep deprivation is a big, huge part of this race. These are some brothers that have done the race together a few times um, out there again this year. Um, Ms. Ms. Perigo could probably tell us about this picture, but uh, yeah. Uh, we've had some incidents with Asian carp out there. We've had some injuries, significant injuries. To, we've had paddlers knocked out of the race from Asian carp. We've had people have to get surgery uh, after being hit with an Asian carp. Uh, it is an issue, and it's one thing that the out-of-state paddlers are pretty shocked by when they experience that. Um, certainly one thing we've learned from the Texas racers that we've all picked up on now is just the NASCAR-style approach to a checkpoint. When you see an a experienced racer pull into a checkpoint, I mean, they just throw their empty jugs out and their ground crews put fresh stuff in. They throw their trash out and their ground crews pick it up and they're gone. I mean, that's how you do this race. And I think the record now is 33 hours and one minute. Wow. Um, you can do the math on that. That's 10 plus miles an hour all the way down nonstop. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think they stopped. Um, but we also have some you know, sedate Family Adventures, this is a family, um, the Jackson family, and they did the race, and then they wrote a book about doing the race. And this book is available on Amazon, and all the proceeds go to River Relief, 
and you can download the electronic version for like three bucks or you can get this version for, I don't know, 10 bucks or something. Totally, totally worth it. And it will, if you're thinking of doing the race, it will shorten the learning curve uh, a lot for you. So consider that. And I will, I will give this one away to whoever buys Steve Schnarr a beer. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think they're from Missouri, and the youngest girl in this picture, who I think is in the back, no, she's in the middle. She's actually racing women solo this year. I think she's like 23 or 4 now, but she was just a teenager that particular year in that picture. But uh, he goes through how they approach the race from the very beginning, the training, the nutrition, everything. It's really good. Did anyone offer to buy him a beer? Well, he's got an empty hand. So. <laughs> uh, this race will beat the crap out of you, and uh, and you know we call it death by a thousand cuts is the reason why most people quit the race. It's not usually one particular thing. It's just the overwhelming, grueling grind of day after day. It'll be the little things you never thought about, like his heel having to be taped up because it rubbed on the bottom of his kayak so long, or you know, his back from his PFD, or, you know, I mean, he ended up finishing though. It was a happy finish for him, but I mean, just, it's a beast. It's a sausage grinder. Uh, here's another stand-up paddleboard. You know, again, when Shane builds these paddleboards, he never, he literally drags them to the starting line and they're still hot from the epoxy curing. He doesn't know if they're gonna float. He doesn't know how they're gonna steer it. And then he somehow suck, suckers 12 people into getting on and then they finish and have a great time. But it just shows you the creativity and the, um, the spirit that, that is in the race. You've got the people who are in it to break the record and then you've got the people who are in it to have this you know, experience of climbing Mount Everest in their backyard. Uh, this guy did the race a couple different times. This particular year, he hauled his canoe or his bicycle all the way on the back of his canoe, and then he built the bike back together at the finish line and biked back to Kansas City on the Katy Trail uh, after doing the, the 340. After he got bored with that, he built a canoe out of blue barrels and uh, humiliated a lot of racers in fancy carbon fiber boats and did the race in like 51 hours or something. This is our award ceremony, what it looks like at the Lewis and Clark Boathouse. And um, it's always packed and just everybody is so excited. It's like a, a pep rally and everybody gets medals at finish. And of course, a few people get the fancy trophies and so on, but it's just, if you've never been there, it's a feeling that's difficult to describe, but it is really this feeling of family and community at the end. I mean, you didn't know any of these people at Caw Point. Now you've got these best friends that you paddled all night with and had all these experiences with, and um, it's really a neat vibe there at the end. Uh, we get people from all over. You know, we've had, I think, a typical year, we have people from 37 states come here to do the race. Um, and yes, Hawaii, we've had someone from Hawaii, we've had someone from Japan, we've had people from Mexico, Canada, Great Britain, Australia. I mean, the secret's out and they love coming here and they come back again and again to do your river. Uh, again, the, the finish line is a pretty unique and amazing place and there's a lot of tears. They're not tears of pain or sadness, they're really like tears of joy and there's a lot of uh, excitement there. Uh, the safety boat teams, a lot of you know this character, Bill Fessler. Uh, the safety boats have a wonderful time out there. I can't, you know, once I get a guy to do safety boat, he's mine forever. Like the safety boat guys love the experience. It's grueling and tough for them as well. That's the Quindaro, piloted by Mark Hanley and Bill Fessler, and sometimes Mylon Rogers. Uh, that's my boat that I drive. Um, Sometimes we have fog and other issues, but we try to keep a good sense of humor about it. And here's another look at the, uh, the meat grinder experience. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people, a trophy or a medal is not enough, so they go 
straight from St. Char- from the finish line. There's a guy in St. Charles that does these tattoos, and I don't know who he is. He's not, he's not paying me any royalties, but he should be. Um, but I just, you know, if you just Google MR340 tattoo, these are the PG-13 ones I can show you. But uh, a lot of people put their finish times, um, a lot of creative ink here. Um, that's the husband and wife team, so those are two different people's legs. <laughs> and uh, there's the, always the obligatory, you know, celebratory photo at the end. These go on all night and all day. Uh, this is the team that actually broke that record, 33 hours and one minute. And, you know, I mean, some of them look like pretty average guys that you might find on a couch watching an NFL game, but um, <laughs> you, you have the, the right kind of training, the right kind of attitude, and... It's amazing what they can accomplish, but um, yeah, we know those two girls, don't we? This is the gentleman from Japan that came over to do the race, and then he immediately went back to Japan and started a ultra marathon race there. So that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, just the the spirit there is pretty good. We've had some young kids do the race with their dad. Uh, I think this year we're going to have the first kid, if I'm doing the math right, I'm probably wrong, but he's 11 and he's going to do it with his mom and dad. And I think he's the first kid to do the race that wasn't born when the first race happened. (laughs) I guess we better get used to that. But but anyway, uh, you know, Jeff Barrow said to me, and and we were both crying when he, when he told me this, because you cry a lot, uh, you know, after you've been awake for 72 hours straight. Yeah. <laughs> but he, you know, in that, in that way that only Jeff Barrow can, you know, where he grabs you and he's kind of wobbling a little and he's looking up and he, he said, you know, this race, this race, he said, I was, I was at a checkpoint, it's the middle of the night and there were some kids there helping their dad back in the boat and he paddled away and, and they yelled, I love you, Dad. And he said back, I love you, too, as he paddled in the darkness. And he said, that's just, you know, the spirit of, of what we've got going on here. And, and he's right. It is, uh, it is pretty cool. And if, uh, if you have a chance to experience it, I hope you'll be out there with us, whether it's as a volunteer or as a competitor. Um, you know, just let us know, and we will find a place for you out there with us. So thank you very much for, for coming out. It's ten after, so. What do you think? Probably. Yeah, but yeah. So, we're gonna take questions because are there any questions here? Just give me a little like, yeah, I got a question. Yeah, there's one. There'll be 12 more. I'm going to run around, and, and I'm going to find you question-haver people. And you're going to ask them, and Scott's going to answer them, maybe. Is this still working, Dave? Yep. All right. Scott, I was wondering if you ever had a, a desire to have a chance of that medicine that you're dishing out to everybody else. You have never done the race, have you? You remember that scene in Tom Sawyer when he's painting the fence? And, I mean, uh, yes, it, it's tempting, you know, the dream would just, I mean, that would be great, honestly, to just have to just worry about my little boat, my little universe, only have to worry about that. That would actually be really uh, amazing. And I think that'll probably happen someday when I'm, you know, a lot older. But um, yeah, I really wanted to that first year and it just, didn't work out, but I've had plenty of time on the Missouri, so I don't feel cheated in any way. Okay, here's our next one. How many people have died or sustained very serious injuries in these races? Zero. Uh, Now, I mean, I think the most serious injury, and 
I mean, we've had, you know, probably, and a lot of you know Jed Fredrickson, maybe here. I mean, Jed had to have his shoulder rebuilt after a carp caught him just at the right part of his stroke and just tore everything. I mean, it was pretty major, but he's been back and raced since. But I would say that was the biggest injury we've ever had. I mean, we've we've had people stumble and you know fall at a boat ramp and things like that but nothing we've had some people get so dehydrated and um on really hot days and these are generally like your high-end athletes who push way too hard um we've had people have to get ivs at the hospital just to rehydrate um but no fatalities and um, the texas water safari has had a couple fatalities uh, just in the last 10 years. One for sure that I know of. And that was actually the case of a guy that drank too much water um, without enough electrolytes. So if you're, and he was again, a very high performing athlete, way up ahead in the race and was drinking so much and was sweating so much in that Texas humidity that, you know, essentially your heart just stops. Like you don't have the electrolytes to carry the signal, I guess. And that's called hypo neutremia um, but not luckily thankfully have we had anything like that the barge incident would have been the closest call and we've never had a close call like that now I've had terrifying phone calls um, you know one time I had a girl call me I don't know why these things are always in the middle of the night her name was Hillary and uh, and you know it's the most helpless feeling but you know this young girl screaming on the other end of the phone like i need somebody to come get me you know this this barge is trying to run me down and <laughs> and you know I'm, I'm trying to get her to explain where are you what's the situation and she would be talking to me and then she would just scream the shriek and she's she dropped the phone and she paddled really hard and she said oh my gosh that was so close well <laughs> i still to this day do not know what was going on <laughs> but Finally, I, you know, as I'm talking to her and I'm getting in my boat and I'm trying to figure out, I don't even know which direction to go to get this girl. Uh, I hear this guy's voice on the phone and he says, Hillary, what are you doing over there? And she looks at him and it's like her head cleared and she's like, she starts laughing. She's like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what I'm doing over here. And she, she says, Scott, I'm fine. And she hangs up and paddles. <laughs> so I mean, she was in an eddy or something and there was something she thought was a barge and she just kept getting twirled around now steve steve has a great story he can tell you sometime about the guys and the martians and the you know they were on another planet and um that's an impressive tale as well but uh nothing tragic thankfully okay there's so this is our first ever but we have a question on facebook apparently <laughs> do we know what it is yet what is the oldest person to finish the race? Okay. Well, that would be Dale Sanders. He was 80 or 81 when he did one of those four-man stand-up paddle boards. Oh. And that was probably Dale asking the question, hey, Dale. <laughs> <laughs> you still got the record, buddy. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take this one here, Donna Sue. I just want to know what, what phone server she has because even now I cannot make phone calls from on the river. <laughs> oh gosh, yes, that's a great one. Yeah, we um, so at any given ramp, like one of the three major carriers will work, and the other two have to borrow that person's phone and, and make a phone call. So I mean, I've used Sprint with good success for many years because Sprint would roam so well. And I would always be roaming, but I always had a signal. And I wasn't so great last year for some reason. I don't know if that was my phone or some other issue. But I hear good things about Verizon. I hear good things about AT&T. And I hear good things about Sprint. But at any given ramp, someone is cursing their particular carrier because in that town, that phone doesn't work. It, you know, it has improved from 2006. And I think it will continue to improve. And someday, I think we'll look back on this lack of technology the same way we you know we kind of laugh about the uh, eight track yeah when are you gonna do something about those buoys <laughs> <laughs> write your congressman uh yeah that's you know from a tech from a technology point of view the buoys are pretty much superfluous at this point i mean all those barge captains have the chart plotter that shows them exactly where everything is and it's almost you know, it's, it's become very, very easy to navigate the river. Yeah, 
So, I mean, I, I don't know what to do short of shooting a hole in them as we go by. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but um, uh, I, think, I think the will to put those out seems to be waning. Um, at least the quality of the work seems to be waning over time. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know how much longer that'll happen, but I think technology has sort of made it, you know, I think the Coast Guard likes doing it because it's a budget line item for them, but I don't know um, how useful it is anymore, honestly. We've got a question from a, a future 340 paddler here, I think. <laughs> Are you ready? How many boats is the way? How many boats finish the race? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, typically about 68% finish, uh, depending on the year. Now last year was high water along with cool temperatures. We had a much higher finish rate. I think it was 75 plus percent maybe that finished. Another interesting question is how many don't show up? And uh, it's about 20% sign up and never show up. 18 to 20%. Uh, men's solo and women's solo being the highest no-show rate. I think a lot of people sign up with good intentions in January, just like you know you maybe you've gotten a gym membership in January before. <laughs> and uh, you know by May or June, it's like this isn't going to happen, and they write us and say we're not going to come. So, Mr. Dufer? Yeah. How big is too big, or is there really no such thing? <laughs> so, Robin Kaltoff, uh, how big is too big at Waverly? <laughs> like. Uh, Robin, run, he may be gone. He runs the checkpoint at Waverly. It's really a matter of, Robin, you want more boats at Waverly or is, is 500 about right? More volunteers. Okay, yeah. We had two ramps there and it's busy. Yeah. It's busy. I mean, those first few checkpoints, Lexington and Waverly, and you don't have to stop at a checkpoint. We, we give people other options of places they can stop and meet their ground crew. but. You know, these checkpoints, a lot of cool things happen there. And one of the cool things is that the communities along the way, like Waverly and Miami, they will provide food to the racers, like a concession stand. It's usually like a Boy Scout troop or something like that. And they make a ton of money. Like the, the team at Herman that does the food at Herman, that, that ramp's open 48, 50 some hours. And those Boy Scouts make enough at that event it pays for all their campouts for the entire year. I think it's like 5,000 bucks they make um, by selling pancakes and hot dogs and coffee and snow cones. Snow cones. <laughs> and the, the town of Miami, it's not the Boy Scouts of Miami, it's the town, and Miami's not a big town. But they've done, they've been able to do some civic works with the money they make from their thing. Like they paved the, you know, the post office parking lot or city hall parking lot or something like that one year with their proceeds and they make multiple thousands of dollars as well from racers. Miami's just a place, natural place the river, everybody kind of gets there at midnight or so, and they stop for a few hours and eat a bunch of pancakes. And So that's a neat part of the race too, but how big is too big? I mean, once upon a time I thought 75 was gonna press the limits of this thing. So we've been bumping it up 30, 40, 50 boats a year, and we'll just see. You know, one aspect of it is now, Whereas James Fawcett was all by himself in 2006, puking his guts out and needed help, you're never by yourself anymore. I mean, you wish you had more privacy, probably, sometimes. There's always a boat in front of you, there's always a boat behind you, there's always some guy right next to you. I mean, it's it's pretty tight group, so to me, that, that safety net is improved by more actors. So Scott, if, if people wanted to take a year off from the 340, you and can't volunteer, Don't even think about it. and volunteer instead, and help at a boat ramp or help in a safety boat or something like. How do they go about um, like making that known that they they want to help out somewhere? Uh, Scott at rivermiles.com is my email address. You can find it at rivermiles.com. Our Facebook group. Uh, there's lots of ways you can get in touch with us and just say you'd like to volunteer. And the volunteers have a really good time. They're exhausted, just like the racers, but uh, good experience for sure. I've got another uh, question. This family over here is just hogging the mic. Oh, OK. <laughs> How old do you have to be? So the youngest, and again, he had a bet with his dad I'll, about this. I'll mess this up, but I feel like the youngest we've ever had is 11. And there's really our insurance 
doesn't care as long as your dad or mom is willing to sign your life away on that piece of paper. Um, you To go by yourself, you have to be 18. To go with mom or dad, I don't think there is any age limit. We have had someone bring their dog. Um, that was the first year, and that was a huge mistake. But uh, he did not finish. Neither did the dog. But... Um, <laughs> We've, we've seen it all. Are there any other questions? We love questions. What about the electric race? Yeah, oh. The E340, so yeah, we... <laughs> um, close the bar, please. <laughs> uh, we did have an E340 that ran parallel. Was, you had to have solar power on your boat, and um, I don't think anyone made it to the finish line. So maybe we'll try that again sometime. Um, I mean, that would be fun. There were some interesting boats that showed up. But, uh, yes, because it was a flood year, because I actually had those as two separate races, but we combined them because it was a makeup flood year. So. Experimental. Yes, yes. We've seen some interesting, we have pedal drive division. Jericho's built some really crazy uh, pedal drive boats. Yeah. So you can pedal this race if you've got a bad shoulder or whatever. Hop in and use the legs. Well, Scott, thank you so much for- My pleasure. My pleasure. Pretty obvious that I don't need another one. That's fine. <laughs> um, guys, thank you so much.